If you want to pay substantially more for a brand new house and pay substantially more in interest, there's good news. Krista Freeland has your back. She just introduced 30-year amortizations on insured mortgages for first-time homebuyers who buy new properties. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is problematic. It's going to create higher home prices and cost a lot of first-time homebuyers who probably don't know any better a significantly higher amount of money to own a home over the next 30 years. But before I get into it, my name is Noel Mathias, and if you want the latest Canadian financial and real estate news, this is the place for you. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button and hit the like button so more people like you can see this video. Oh, and by the way, if you're looking down and you're going, hey, I thought I was subscribed to Nolan's channel and it's not showing as subscribed, that's because this is a new channel dedicated to the Canadian real estate space. The old channel, the bigger channel still exists, but it is more focused on global wealth and economic issues. So if you aren't subscribed to this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to make a somewhat quick video on this topic because there is a lot to unpack here, but really the topic is one that isn't going to take a lot of time to cover because these changes are very niche. They are only applicable really to first-time homebuyers and they're gonna cause some problems in the Canadian real estate market. And I'll explain why in a second here, but first let's take a look at the changes. And I've laid this all out, simple to understand. First, the big change. 30-year amortizations are now available on brand new builds for first-time home buyers who are putting down less than 20%. Yes, I probably should have put the clarification in here that this is for insured mortgages and for less than 20% down payment, but I'm saying that right now, so excuse the fact that it's not on the slide. Now, this is a massive change. 30-year amortizations went away a long time ago, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in 2012, and there was good reason for it. It was because it was providing access to the housing market that pretty much inflated the housing market. So longer amortizations lead to higher qualifications, which lead to higher purchase prices. So the very problem that Canada is facing right now, which is higher purchase prices, is probably going to be made worse by this policy. And there's a whole bunch of other issues that come along with this as well, which I'll get to in a second. And by the way, I'm going to show you at the end of this video, the exact numbers with respect to what a 30 year amortization means when it comes to the cost of housing, because not only is this policy going to increase housing prices in all likelihood, but it also means that Canadians, especially first time home buyers buying brand new properties are going to end up paying substantially more, not just in the nominal price, but in the interest costs over the life of the mortgage. So I'll show you all that a little bit later on. But there's also some other changes and, and some of these are actually good. So increasing the home buyer's plan limit from $35,000 to $60,000, this is the amount of money that you can pull out of your RSP interest-free. This is a good change. And you know, I think that the home buyer's plan, the RSP plan, and even the first time home buyer's plan, the new plan are both very good plans. And they give you the ability to make contributions get a tax refund as a result, take that tax refund, make more contributions. It's the fastest and the best way for a home buyer, a first time home buyer to save for a down payment. So I think this is actually a pretty good change. Now, there are some things that go along with this, which I'll get to in a minute. And then on top of that, there are going to be changes to the Canadian Mortgage Charter. Now, I need to remind everybody here that the Canadian Mortgage Charter is not law. This is a set of rules, a set of guidelines that the government has created with respect to how banks operate when it comes to their mortgages. And this is like a best practices thing. This is a, hey, the government expects you to do this thing, but it is not something that is actually required. And what they're doing is they're going to include an expectation that where appropriate, permanent amortization relief be provided. So if somebody has a variable rate mortgage, and it has fixed payments and they get into a negative amortization scenario, or if somebody is in a situation where they have a health issue or something like that, the government is expecting banks to work with mortgage holders to increase their amortization so that they have some relief. Now, by the way, this is not a policy that is new. This is something that banks have done for decades, like a long time, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. My mom was with Bank Montreal for 47 years. I remember her talking about this when I was a kid. It's something that is inherently an approach that banks take when it makes sense. So if somebody has a health issue, a bank's going to help them out. Now, if somebody's just a deadbeat and isn't making their payments, well, they're probably not going to. And I suspect that the where appropriate piece of this covers that. So don't expect that you can just say, hey, I want a longer amortization because I can't afford the house I bought. You're going to have to have some reasons why I'm fully expecting. 
And then on top of that, you have the home buyer's plan grace period is extended by three years. So in other words, you're gonna have three years longer if you use that RSP home buyer's plan. And you'll have up to five years before you actually need to restart payments. So in other words, you get that first five year term where you don't have to be repaying back to your home buyer's plan, your RSP plan, which is probably a pretty good thing, especially if you're considering taking $60,000 out of it. Now, let's talk about the good here. So these policies, and I'm probably gonna focus on the 30 year amortization piece going forward here because that is the big one. So there's some good here. It incentivizes home builders to build homes under a million dollars because in order for a first time home buyer to take advantage of the 30 year amortization on an insured mortgage, they actually have to be buying a house that can be insured, which means it has to be valued at under a million dollars. So there's going to be some incentives for builders to build these properties. And on top of that, home buyers are also going to get that ability to pull more money from their RSP, which if they're making those contributions, great, not a bad change overall. And the last, and this is kind of a good thing, I'll get to why it isn't in a second, is that these changes are going to help first time home buyers qualify for bigger mortgages. But they're going to need to be able to qualify for bigger mortgages because there's going to be a problem. So let's talk about the bad with respect to these policies. The first one is that this is going to create significantly more demand for new homes under a million dollars. And we already know that builders can't build these homes at the pace necessary. So now we're incentivizing borrowers to buy the brand new homes because they can get a 30 year amortization, which means there's going to be longer lineups for those homes. The builders are going to be able to charge more for those homes because there is a higher amount of demand. And this is ultimately going to push up prices of those brand new homes. And when the prices of those brand new homes get pushed up, guess what's going to happen? the rest of the home prices are going to come up with them. So this is definitely going to have an inflationary effect on the prices of homes. There's no way around that. There's no conversation to be had here. This is an inflationary measure. And we heard the Bank of Canada come out a few months ago and say one of their biggest problems is the government spending and the inflationary effect that the government spending is having. Well, just add this to the list of inflationary things that the government is doing to arguably buy votes. And then there's other problems here as well. So when it comes to buying a home and you're buying resale, typically you go into that transaction having your own realtor, your own representation, the seller has their representation, and you have a contract that is very much a two-way contract. It typically doesn't benefit the buyer or the seller. It's designed to be fair and what you negotiate is what you negotiate. But one of the things that people don't know about buying a new home is quite often the contracts are there to benefit the seller, the new home builder, not the buyer. And this creates a bunch of problems. In fact, most of the problems that we see when it comes to people buying homes and having a problem when it comes to qualifying for the mortgage, when it comes to actually closing on the property is with new home buyers. Very rarely do we see somebody who's buying a resale property get into a situation where at closing they can't afford to buy the property or where the mortgage isn't being funded because something happened. Like on resale, 99% of the time, the deals close no problem. But as many of you know, especially with pre-construction and whatnot, there is a lot of times where we see problems on new builds. And there's two reasons for this. One is just because of the timelines associated with actually taking possession of a new property. And the other is the fact that the contracts are designed to benefit the builders, not the consumer. And on top of that, yes, you can have representation from a realtor when you go into a builder, but this is kind of discouraged. And what's even worse is often when you have a realtor who takes you in to buy a new home or introduces you to a builder, quite often they let the builder just handle the whole thing. They know that there isn't much that they can negotiate on the contracts. So they just step aside and let you deal with the builder on your own. And this becomes problematic again because whether you were using a realtor and they introduced you and were a part of the process or not, if they aren't actually representing you, they can't protect you. And if you were buying from a new builder unprotected, well, that creates a lot of issues. So this is going to be a problem. On top of that, it pushes out the timelines for buying a home. So if you are buying a brand new build and it's a spec home and you can take possession next month, no problem. But let's say you're buying six months out or a year out or 18 months out, or in some cases, we've even seen builders say, well, we'll have this property ready three or four years from now. Well, it pushes out the timelines and that creates risks. 
it creates risk from the perspective of if you lose your job, are you going to be able to qualify for the mortgage when it comes time to actually close on that property? It creates risk from the perspective of what if interest rates go up? It is often very hard to get a long-term rate hold. And when you do get a rate hold for a long period of time, it often comes at a premium to what the current rates are. So if you're buying a property a year out from now, you may have to pay 6% on interest instead of 5% on interest because you're paying a premium to have that rate hold extended longer. And then last but not least is what happens if the market turns? And this is a real possibility. Even though it seems like immigration is high, even though it seems like the market is going to continue to go up and up and up, there is a real possibility that the market turns because real estate markets can turn pretty much on a dime. And if they do, and you haven't taken possession of the property because it's a year or 18 months out until you're going to be able to do that, and the value goes down substantially, well, that can create problems from a financing perspective, but it can also create significant problems purely from the perspective of you're buying a home that is no longer worth what you agreed to pay for it. And I don't think I have to explain why that is a problem. Now, on top of that, there are some major issues with just taking a 30-year mortgage. In fact, even though 30-year mortgages are available on mortgages where you put more than 20% down, very rarely do we actually see our clients taking those mortgages. And the reason why is because once they understand the difference in cost and the difference in equity that they will have at the end of five years, they typically shy away. So you have to understand that if you take a 30-year mortgage, over the life of the mortgage, there's going to be a substantial increase in interest costs, and there isn't going to be a ton of benefit. Now, on top of that, yes, going from 25 years to 30 years is going to increase the amount that people qualify for. However, those increases will be proportional to the increases in prices, at least in all likelihood. So in other words, these first time home buyers are thinking, hey, yes, I'm going to have a option to get a 30 year mortgage. That's going to allow me to qualify for ten or fifteen thousand dollars more in purchase price or twenty five thousand dollars more in purchase price, whatever the number is. That's a great thing, but keep in mind that when you create a lot of demand for brand new homes, the builders are going to see this, they're going to increase the housing prices, and you're going to probably end up just buying the exact same home that you could have bought before this policy with a 25-year mortgage for substantially cheaper. And you're going to pay a premium for it because that's just the way economics works. So in other words, what's going to happen here is you're going to have somebody who goes, yeah, I got a 30-year mortgage, so it increases the amount I qualify for by 5, 10, 15%, whatever the number is. I think it's probably closer to about 7%. So they're thinking that they can buy more homes, but the builders are going to say, hey, we've got the market cornered on this. We've got more demand from first-time home buyers, so we're going to increase the housing prices. And as a result, you're going to end up buying the exact same home that you could have bought today with a 25-year amortization except you're going to pay a little bit more for it because you now qualify for more and because other people are competing for those properties. And by the way, you are going to pay substantially more in interest. So at the end of the day, you're paying more for the property. You're going to pay more in interest. And as you are probably figuring out, that's why this is an awful policy. And to put this in perspective, at the end of five years, you're going to have 28% less equity and over the life of the mortgage, the 30 years, you're going to pay about 24% more in interest. That's assuming interest rates stay the same. Now, I want to show you the actual numbers on this. Uh, this is just assuming a $500,000 mortgage. It's assuming the annual interest rate is going to stay at 5%. It's probably not. You're probably going to end up paying more interest, uh, a higher interest rate at some point over the life of the mortgage. So keep that in mind. The difference in payments ends up being, you know, about $250.00. But here's where the numbers get really interesting, right? Because the total interest cost on this hypothetical mortgage is going to be about $372,000 if it was a 25 years amortization. Now it's going to pump up to about $460,000. So in addition to the fact that this is going to cause the price of the home that you're buying to go up, you're also paying in interest costs substantially more, which is increasing the overall cost of the home. But here's the real kicker. After five years, you only pay about $1,000 more in interest, but you have about $16,000 less in equity. And this is why this is so important, because that equity that you aren't creating is going to put people in a situation where if they need to sell, they may not be able to, because they may not be able to afford the real estate fees. They may not be able to afford the payout penalty. The fact that this is putting Canadians in a position where they're going to have less equity less options, pay substantially more in interest, and probably not be able to buy a bigger home or a nicer home 
or even have more options to enter into the market just makes this bad policy. And on top of that, it's pretty clear that it is just vote buying. So for the clients who come to us, if somebody wants a 30 year amortization, it's their prerogative, it's their choice. We'll help them get it. But we're gonna also make sure that they understand the difference in the numbers. Because at the end of the day, our role is to have our clients back. And if you're looking at getting a mortgage, I highly recommend that when you do so, download the app that's linked in the description below so that you can run the numbers for yourself or reach out to us so that we can run the numbers for you and you can make an informed decision instead of just jumping on the 30 year bandwagon that ultimately is just going to create another problem in Canadian housing. Oh, and by the way, even though the Bank of Canada didn't increase interest rates recently, if you want to see a video about what they actually did, which was kind of increase interest rates, at least in the long run, make sure you check out this one right here.